Yawn, yawn, yawn. Here we are. You need a mic. Every, everybody needs a mic. Everybody needs a mic. This is episode 14, isn't it? It is episode 14, that. So here we are with episode 14 of Studio Life, the longer format brother, sister hybrid of Is It Shit? I did the shit there myself. Good. Yeah. So um, uh, let's begin with some... Ooh. News. 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 Well, first bit of news, Dan nearly fell asleep in the last episode. I didn't nearly fall asleep, but <laughs> I did fall asleep. <laughs> Sean takes me out for lunch and buys me beer and feeds me food. And then we sit in a warm studio and I'm an old man. And that's, <laughs> it's what happens. It's very funny. So anyway, we drink some coffee. Coffee's a good plan. Right. News. Well, this, this news is a bit of a request, really, of our lovely audience out there. Mm. We would like you to... Both of them. Both of you, yeah. Mm. We'd like you to suggest some songs that we can talk about in the Retro Talk section. What songs from your life that you love would you like to know a little bit about? Yeah. And we'll, we'll do the research and we'll tell you. So suggest some things like that. Also, the hot topic we do at the end of the show, suggest some ideas for that. What are some interesting things you would like us to discuss? Yeah. Be great. What's, what? It, yeah, anything to do with music or production or fun and film or, you know... Anything. Yeah. Anything you like. We'll, we'll gladly chat about it. Um, and lastly, someone asked me to review my Dyn Audio Lid 48s, which are sat behind us. Uh, I don't think that warrants the whole show, but I'll gladly tell you what they're like. Um, Dyn Audios, for me, I think are quite um, unflattering to listen to. There's lots of speaker brands out there like Adam and to a certain extent the, the Rocket Range, that kind of stuff from KRK. They make everything sound pretty great. These don't make things sound great. They're really quite I think hard. that's probably just you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just me. It, it, you have to work harder for things to sound great on them, and that's kind of why I like them. I originally worked on Dyn Audio M1s like nearly 30 years ago now, and they were the same. Uh, I've worked on BM6s and BM15s and all kinds of Dyn Audio speakers over the years. Uh, but these, these are great. I love them. The Frinks response amazing. Uh, that you can tailor them to your room so they have a three-way switch. You can adjust the amount of low end. You can adjust the amount of level. They've got an XLR in. They've got a TRS in. You can run them standing up. We can run them lying down sideways. I think they're pretty amazing, to be honest. But if you want to impress clients regularly, they're probably not the monitors for you. These are hard work to get to sound great, but I think you can trust them once they do. Are they active? Yeah, yeah, they're active, yeah, amps, amps buried in the back of them. Because I, um, I often wondered, people always complained about NS10s. Mm -hmm. I've got some friends that will not work on them. No, and you often friends, think yeah. about whether so. it's because of the amps that are driving them. Like, they are the most picky speakers in the world. Mm. If, if you, I love them. Yeah, I, I love them. But if you put them with the wrong amp, they sound absolutely disastrous. Mm. It's really strange. They need a lot of power, and they're very picky about the amps. Yeah. Mine will feed back. I've got. I use mine for my uh, record deck setup. Oh yeah, they'll feed back with a, a pair with of SL12s or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. hundred percent they will. Well, yeah. that's the amount of pokey middle, and mm. then you know the stylus not yeah. far away. Yeah, and it, oddly enough, when you've got the lid down, yeah, they feed back more. The lid obviously is creating a little, yeah, <laughs> little enclosure. Yeah, there. a little feedback enclosure, a little zone. Yeah, but yeah, I highly recommend the lid 48s. I, I, I. I'm not sure it's one of those things you could pick from a shop. You'd have to try them in your own studio to know whether they work for you or not. But loads of bottom end. Very clean top end. Not over-exaggerated at all. Very much like them. Anyway, there you go. That's the lid 48s. That was news, which must mean, Dan, it's time for plug-in news. Which brings us to another top five, doesn't it? It does. So, Sean, tell us, what top five are we doing this week? Well, last time we looked at surgical EQs for fixing issues and all that kind of stuff, all the boring bit of EQ. So I thought we'd do the other end. We'd do the top five analogue modelled EQs. Mm -hmm. The exciting EQs. The exciting EQs, the fun ones, the ones that sound like pieces of hardware and, and operate in a very similar way. The fun, the fun EQs. The fun EQs. Apparently. Well. Okay, so here we go. Number five, we in have. Number five, we have the Brainworks BX Console 9099, which is the Amec 9098. It came out, I think it was the very first plugin we reviewed on Is It Shit. 
Tonight we're going to party like it's 1999. Yeah. It's an amazing plug-in, such a great sounding, very analog, some lovely sort of thick tones when you push into it. Like it. This comes in, uh, uh, regularly you see that now on discount on Plug-in Alliance, don't you? Yeah, it's really cheap now, yeah. Yeah, you can pick it up very cheap. It sounds great. Really do, really do recommend it. In four. Mm -hmm. In at number four, I've got to go with the SSL uh, Channel Strip 4000E. From SSL themselves, recently come out to work with the UC1. It's just, I mean, I, I grew up on the SSL E channel, love it. I think that EQ is is fantastic. It sounds just like it to me. What's not to love? In three. In three, I'm going to go with the Noise Ash Rule Tech EQ1A, which is their Poltec, which is arguably better than an actual Poltec. One, because it's really cheap. Two, it sounds bit better than a real one and and yeah you can have as many as you like i'm a massive noise ash fan noise ash are amazing yeah we love them massive noise ash fan so we are now into in two into in a, into into two two uh <laughs> back back with noise ash again it's the noise ash need 31102 which you know if you're a knee fan that that particular desk, that particular eq that's amazing it's a beautiful sounding thing it's very cheap it sounds great use it all the time so, bully special prize. Well, this is controversial. Uh -huh. Well, I wouldn't expect anything less from you, dear Shawnee. The Vustek Model N channel, not been out very long, properly upset the Apple cart, properly upset some people. There are people online genuinely upset and saying that there's issues with it, blah, 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 and all the rest of it. Do you know what? It sounds absolutely phenomenal. It sounds in the EQ. I mean, I know it's a compressor as well, but the EQ is amazing. We got loads of views on the vi on our review, didn't we, for the Vustek? People loved it. It's, yeah. Well, it's very cheap. It sounds incredible. There's there's very few plugins that sound that analog. Mm. They've got that warmth, that thickness. You know, you can you can hear it, and you know, if you really want to see for yourself, stick it in Plugin Doctor. Just see how many harmonics are coming out of that thing. And admittedly, yeah, you'd have to have a pretty old. Um, you know, Neve EQ to match it. But that's the point. If we wanted something clean, there's plenty of those around. Mm. This thing is 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 filthy. Really Absolutely. Like. Another fantastic top five there. Excellent. Good stuff. Oxalante. Oxalante. Said the man from Ferrero Rocher. Ferrero Rocher. You are spoiling us. <laughs> <laughs> so that must mean it's time for Retro Talk. <laughs> It is time for Retro Talk. All right, Metal Mickey. <laughs> so this is where we chat about tunes that, that mean something to us and we talk about how they came to be. Dan? Yes. Do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? Uh, you go first this time. Ooh, put me on the spot. Hugo first. Hugo first. Um, okay, so this is a band that I was introduced... I, I heard of them, 1989, I was at school... And this song came on the chart show. Do you remember the chart show? I do, yeah. And it was called 20 Seconds to Comply. And it had samples from Robocop, the original movie. You have to, yeah. And, and it had samples from Psycho, you know, the strings from the shower scene. E, 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 and, and it was like a kicking break beat. And this guy rapping so fast. It was like the fastest rapping I'd ever heard. And rapping in a almost a British accent. Not quite, but almost. And it was just, it was mind blowing. And I remember reading the story somewhere that he'd written it about getting, um, about getting hassled by the cops, you know, at Notting Hill Carnival or something. I'm not sure if that's true. But about a year later, I was working at Matrix in the West End and Silver Bullet came in. And it was a guy called Richard, who was the rapper, who was 18 at the time. And he's DJ, a guy called DJ Mo. And the pair of them came in and I think they were working on a follow up. I can't actually remember. It was either they were working on a follow-up, which was called Bring Forth the Guillotine, or we were reworking things to go on an album. I can't really remember. It was a long time ago. But I remember we did do a song called Bring Forth the Guillotine. And while we were working in that session, which lasted more than a week, I think, um, we sort of redid um, 20 Seconds to Comply. And, you know, all the original instruments came out, and the multi-tracks and stuff, and we sort of tweaked it a bit. It must have been for an album or, or maybe for a remix or something. I can't remember. 
but they were lovely guys they were they were very friendly uh sort of properly took me under their wing uh the guy who was taught you how to well yes a dj mo bless him lovely fella um asked me if i could um put together a herbal cigarette for him which I'd, I'd never done before, but, yeah. but he taught me how to do that when a I was 17 years old. What do you mean by herbal well, cigarettes? Well, you know, one of those one of those slightly different tasting cigarettes. No? No. Well, talk to your mum. But it was... Um, well, talk to Frank. <laughs> Not your mum. <laughs> Not your mum. That was yeah. it. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Bless, bless old DJ Mo teaching me that particular skill. Um... So yeah, we were we were working on this in Studio One in Matrix, which was it was always booked out by people that that wanted to use that specific mixing desk. If I remember rightly, it was a very very early serial number SSL E series with recall, but it didn't have the E series EQ. I think the EQ was from the B series, but it was an E series desk with the recall and everything else. And Marshall Jefferson did um, some stuff on that. He's the guy that invented Acid House. Mm. I remember him working gotcha. in there. Um, but yeah, we were working there with Silver Bullet. And it was produced by a guy called Ben Chapman, who he also did the Adamski Killer Mix. Same, maybe the same month. It was around the same time. I think he worked with Betty Boo as well. There was a bunch of stuff he was doing at the time. He was very sort of in demand as a producer. Um, the engineer was a guy called Clive Goddard, who was... Yeah, he was one of the older engineers at the studio. He was kind of teaching me as I went along. He's the guy that taught me on this session how to push the SSL really hard. And it was the first time I'd heard that and seen someone do that. Like, all the, all the meters were in the red. Pushing these break beats and all these samples into it, really slamming it. And it just sounded epic. And it was, it was the first time I'd sort of come across that. Um, I think it was actually recorded at LRG Studios, mixed at Matrix. Uh... I think the original 20 seconds to comply came out December 89. This version we did would have been June or July 1990, I think it was. Um, as I say, yeah, samples from Psycho and Robocop, which I'm thinking about now, that might have been pre the whole sampling legal stuff. Well, you think it, that vocal sample from Robocop, you could, because you had what, <coughs> two, one or two second sample time on a. Uh, back then, no, we had the S1000s by then, so you, you could sample for as long as you wanted, really. Right. Yeah, yeah, you could do. I think it might have been a Casio FZ1, off the top of my head, or mm. or it was a EMU Emacs. I can't remember. I remember seeing them around in that session. But yeah, we, we were sort of unlimited. It was it was like a year after that. It, it, everything had sort of, we had 16-bit and we had, you know, you could sample mm. for a minute if you wanted. That, that had suddenly come in. But yeah, the sample clearance thing, I don't know what was going on in those days. You couldn't sample a Hollywood film no, now. No. You couldn't sample... Well, that was Psycho and Robocop. Well, I've heard... I mean, I don't know about the films, but I've heard people talking about, you know, when they're using samples, hip-hop artists especially, they use Shazam to see whether it's going to get past yeah, yeah, yeah. the clearance. If you Shazam it and it doesn't get picked up on Shazam, yeah. you're all right. Yeah. None of, the, uh, none of the box will pick it up. Well, this was the same period, and I'm pretty sure on this, actually, there was like one of those James Brown guitar stabs. I kind of mm. remember that on this. And they they were just, people were leaving it alone. Yeah. And I remember, it might have been EMI, one of, one of the big labels back around that time suddenly set up a new legal department that was just listening yeah. out for some I actually got a cease and desist from, from Sony. Did you? For yeah. what? Um, I made, it might have been Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. I did a Don't Stop Till You Get Enough with Q-Tip. Yeah. Bootleg. And it, and it went, uh, it, we only pressed the vinyl, like yeah. it wasn't online. And it went, we sold thousands. Yeah. And then, yeah, one day you see a cease and desist. But you know what they said? Well, you know what my, my lawyer said? What? Just don't sign it. That's fair enough. What are they going to do if you don't sign it? What are they going to do? Exactly. Yeah. So stop pressing records and don't sign the cease and How much did you make out of the bootleg? A substantial amount. <laughs> that was back in the days where you sold proper, yeah, yeah, proper, proper numbers. units. Yeah, sale or return. Damn. Driving around to North London in spunky old vans. <laughs> Great days. They were the days. I thought, yeah, they, they were. They were interesting. Right, your turn, Dan. We got. Okay, well, um, this has been inspired a little bit by last time we were talking um, uh, on episode uh, eleven. Uh, I think oh, it, or 12. Okay. We were talking about Rod Temperton mm. and the disco stuff. And I was watching it, it back and I was getting Rod uh, uh, Temperton mixed up with Roger Trotman. Yes, I remember. And I was 
under, under duress from my uh, my better half, forced to clear out the studio in my house, which is just... I used to have a studio that wasn't at my house. Uh, full of stuff, loads of cool stuff, uh, which all then just goes into boxes when you move into a house. And, uh, and one of those things was a Banshee talk box, like the original talk boxes. Um, Describe a talk box for someone that's never seen one. So talk boxes, basically, you plug a speaker cable into a, a box on the floor with the speaker in it, and the speaker is attached to a tube, that, and the tube comes up into your mouth, and it basically, you use your mouth in the same way as when you're talking, but rather than... Uh, it's about that thick. It's a yeah. thick old tube to put in your yeah, mouth, you, isn't it? You, put you in the corner of your mouth. The, you use the synth sound yeah. to do the talking. Um, so it's kind of like a vocoder. In a very... It's not like a... It's, it's not similar, though. It, it, because you're, you, you're using your mouth. But, yeah. you know, I mean, people used to lo use, lose teeth using these things because well, you, yeah. you have such volume coming into your mouth. Yeah. And, um, t I mean, I'll, t I'll be, be honest, and, it, and I, I will say that it, it belonged to my friend uh, Pug, yeah. who sadly we, we lost. Yeah. And um, we would spend hours sat there on keyboards trying to... Because you're right, it's quite a thick... It's like a, it's thicker than a hose pipe. <laughs> in your mouth, trying to go, shaker, shaker, you know. Yeah. Um, so I thought what we'd talk about today was California love. Tune! Because when we used to tour, Sean and I, Sean was the was sort of the bus DJ. He'd have a... a well, before playlists were playlists, really. I've always had a big playlist ready for the bus, yeah. But, but California love, yeah. Dr. Dre, well, Tupac... That was one of the classic tunes that we would always, always play. And that vocal that you hear on that is uh, Roger Trotman playing the talk box. And so it was released in 1993 on Death Row slash Interscope. Um, 93? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Or was that a five? I thought it was 95. Maybe it's a five. It could... Oh, yeah, it's a five. Yeah, 95. <laughs> um, but so... In researching for this uh, particular episode, we were looking up all the samples. Um, that was shocking. It was. It is shocking. It's shocking. We, uh, because, but you, you you watch these old kind of uh, documentaries going back, and that's what people did. They looked for samples. I used to have a friend who would drive around the libraries in London, and he would take uh, as many CDs as he could from each library, he would then photocopy all the sleeves so they had the lyrics. He wow. would and he would catalogue each song from that CD. He'd catalogue the CD alphabetically yep. and then keep a list of what key each song from that CD was in. So that if they were working on a tune and they're like, you know, yep. they're in C minor, he'd be able to say, right, I'll go to the C minor drawer. Yeah. <laughs> which you know what's really interesting. So my vinyl collection, which hasn't really changed much since I was 17. Mm. I've bought a few more since then, but pretty much it's the stuff I bought at that age. If you look through all my vinyl, there's white stickers on the on the centre labels of all of them. Yeah. And it will say, however many seconds, 808 kick. However <laughs> many seconds, 909 <laughs> yeah. snare. However many seconds, nice bass note. There will be little notes on stickers on the centre Where to get your samples from. Because that was where... Because I used to work with that thing over there, the RZ1. You yeah. couldn't really back up your samples. So I'd just make a note of where they were and go and resample them when well, I needed them. It was like when we were at Rick's, wasn't it? Where he had the sticker on the top of his Lindrum. Yeah. Have you remembered to back store to today's cassette, sequence yeah. on cassette? There yeah. So, um... Yeah, so, so so Roger Trotman. Incidentally, um, I worked with a band called Pendulum, and they did a track called "The Other Side," which the vocals the vocals were performed on Talkbox. Mm. And I know as a, for a fact that when they they actually recorded that, they had to fly somebody like a Talkbox player in. So obviously you sequence the melody, yeah. but they had to fly somebody in to be able to get the to vocals it. intelligible enough to get down to track. Yeah, but listen. when we toured and we were doing it live, Rob, who was the the sort of lead singer, the lead guy, yep. actually did. The synth was sequenced, but he would sing the vocals oh, okay. through a talk box. Cool. Yeah, you quite often see it, don't you? You see a, a pipe yeah. taped to a mic yeah. stand just sticking outside of the mic. Well, the other one, I, I was, I'm going to do it again, is the guy that cut, but... Um, Show me the way. Somebody, somebody live. Oh. I want you 
to show me the way. Anyway, that was a big talk box song. So, in researching for this, it turns out that the piano and the brass, so dun 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 Do you know where that came from? Well, I do, yeah, because you told me. But It's a Joe Cocker song. I know. You've got to go and listen. What's it called? The song is called... I didn't write down the name of the song. If you just Google <laughs> Joe Cocker, California Love Sample, go and have a listen to the song. It's, it's the piano it's, and the brass. It's frightening. You, you go and listen. It's just yeah. been compressed in EQ. Yeah. It's, so, so it, you know. And similarly, uh, the the bit, California knows how to party in the, whole the city. Yeah, the whole thing. The city of Compton. Who was that? That was Ronnie Hudson. That's actually a song before yeah. California Love. It's amazing. It's yeah. pretty much the whole lyric. And this is what people would do. They would find samples and build tunes yeah. out of samples. So I've got a little bit, you know, Keys was Sean uh, Beanie Thomas. Uh, there was Carl Butch Small, who was the recording engineer. They had three backing vocalists. Uh, Keston Wright um, was, and, and Rick Clifford were the mixing engineers. But of course, do you remember the video? Yeah, of course. It was like uh, Beyond Thunderdome, wasn't it? It was yeah, like Mad, Mad Max. Max vibe, yeah. You realise now, and again, you listen back to that Eminem stuff. Hi, my name is... Yeah. My na- you know, all of that stuff. It all is born from samples. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, if you've got a label that can pay for the samples or can buy out the samples... Yeah. You know. The other thing that's got to be said about that mix is that I still blast it out of the PA system every yeah. now and again because it's... Such a good mix. All of those. The, the, Dre had that. It, it, the beauty was in the simplicity, wasn't it? It, he, it, it wasn't particularly no, heavy. He's clever. It was just. It was quite sparse, which meant yeah. you got the loudness. You listen to any Dre mix. There's 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 a bass yeah. patch. There's there's the drums. It won't be layered. No. There'll be a simple bit of brass or a simple synth or a guitar thing. There won't be layer upon layer. If yeah. you're layering and layering your mixes because you think it's getting better and better, go and listen to something Dre did. Yeah. It's, it's insane. Very simple. Yeah, really simple, really sparse, linear drum grooves. Um, but all of it, it based on samples. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. California love. Love it. Cool. That must mean it's time for a nice hot bath in this week's Hot Topic. It's hot topic. Today's hot topic. We're gonna go deep. How deep? Well, I don't know. I guess we'll just see how deep it goes. <laughs> Couldn't have been in more Alan Partridge <laughs> if we'd have tried. You could swing a tiger in here. <laughs> What's that thing next to the sink? <laughs> Get rid of it. <laughs> I think it's a ritzer. Get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> One flush, gone. One flush, all gone. Back yeah. Rogers' toilet. <laughs> <laughs> right, this week's hot topic. Slightly off-piste. Uh, we're going to talk about music videos. Yes. We've been involved in some music videos. We have. I think I've... Trying to work it out earlier. I think I've directed over 30 now. Made a lot of music videos. And the relevance of music videos to... Your career, if you're a musician or if you're a producer even, there's the co- correlation between putting a piece of music out without something visual to look at and doing that. They, they, they sit very tightly together and it's it's interesting. We were discussing um, how that's changed in that, let's say 20 years ago, if you made a music video, it might have cost you a hundred grand. Mm. And if you were working on a budget, maybe 50 grand. Let's say 10 years ago, you might have been given 10 grand to go and make a music video. But now, realistically, if you get given five grand to make a music video, that's probably about average. It and was it was, it was, was uh, originally, uh, <laughs> it was an art form, mm. uh, you know, that, that tied into the single format, wasn't it? The yeah. first thing that springs to mind is Godley and Creme, who left 10cc and went on to be... Uh, uh, you know, pop video makers. You know, they did um, girls on film and all of these sort of big, you know, yeah. uh, original videos and stuff. But who sits and watches a music video for three and a half minutes nowadays? 
Well, this is it. So there aren't many videos I watch for three and a half minutes now. No, there isn't. And there's there's a lot of artists now who are not bothering making a three yeah. and a half minute music video. We were talking, they, yeah, in they, the pub. What did they do? They'll take that same budget and they'll make maybe 20, 20 second clips, which will end up on TikTok mm. and Instagram. Just the best bits, the bits that they want from the music video to go viral. They'll just shoot those bits. You know, and probably spend the same sort of money, but they'll very specifically tailor these clips to look cool. And it's a bit like pornography, isn't it? You don't want to watch the bit where they're chatting each other up. <laughs> Get straight to the action. Jesus. <laughs> Could always rely on down for a left field comment. Um, yeah, it's true. It's a weird, weird thing, but it's also like we were also discussing earlier in last episode about management and things it's like it's one of the few things now that i really want to talk about when i'm doing a record deal for someone is is what's the budget for the videos because the videos if you put an album out with a single or even if you don't put out a single you know who knows how important that is anymore if you don't put some visuals out there with a new album with a new look it's almost as if what you're doing isn't happening it's it's, it's so vital Part of it for me is that the the joy, you know, of making a good re- making a record that you're happy with. Yeah. You make so many tunes that you you you're not completely happy with. But yeah. on the occasion you make one that you really like, you 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 have a vision a vision. Yeah. You know, and you can see, and I, and that's what I've found in making uh, videos is it is that if the if it's a great track and a great tune, yeah, you feel inspired to make a yeah a visual representation of it definitely you know and it's an artist's opportunity to put it across visually how they see it in their head you know and that's interesting because i've made some videos which were my concept and how i saw something but i've also made probably more than that which weren't my concept and weren't my idea of how mm. it should go they were other people's and then i have to interpret that and make it happen and it's really interesting how people choose to put that stuff across visually and it's um i think it's yeah it's interesting and do you remember in the 80s there was a lot of video all of a sudden there was a you had to have a video mtv launched. oh yeah of course yeah everyone had to have a video all of a sudden and there were so many directors who were clearly used to working on tv adverts suddenly being made to mm. make pop videos and, and there were so many if you watch from that era which were just literal representations of the lyrics like really funny because the lyrics weren't really often making much sense but they thought we'll, we'll do something that's incredibly literal to the lyrics. Yeah. And then it went completely the other way. It goes very avant-garde. And then and now it's we're kind of in this weird netherworld where for a lot of time there was a lot of very sort of misogynistic videos, I suppose there still is, mm. in the whole hip-hop world and stuff. And it's yeah, like yeah. the pop world is kind of going the other way. A lot of female acts taking their power back. And it's like, it's kind of, what do we do now? Yeah. What is the next big thing? How yeah. do we make an impact? The thing is, is a shit music video can ruin a track for you, can't it? A shit music video can, but also, like, look look at a rap video. For, for years and years and years, if a rap video didn't have the camera on the floor with the mm. rapper and his mates leaning over the camera, <laughs> you know, throwing his gang signs yeah. while he's rapping, it wasn't a rap video. Yeah. Whereas now that's very, you know, passe. Yeah. People are being a bit cleverer. But now I think I've seen so many drill videos recently yeah. where it's the rapper and all his mates in masks, all wearing black puffers. Stood in the street. Stood in the street, motorbikes flying mm. around or whatever. It's like, they all look the same. They all yeah. look the same. You've the got crea- to do something different. The creativity's been lost, hasn't it? A little bit. I think it's still out there, but it's 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 not in the acts that are getting the, the, the air be- time. You know, I remember the beauty was, and this we did this a lot in lockdown, me and my, 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 my brother and I. Um, use You can use an iPhone. You totally can. You use an iPhone and a green screen, yeah. and you can do pretty much whatever you want. Yeah. With a bit of imagination and a very small bit of technical logic yeah. uh, knowledge, yeah. you can pull off something that looks pretty spectacular. Yeah, yeah, you can. I mean, the cameras now, we sh- I mean, the camera we shoot this on isn't massively expensive, but I've, you know, I've probably invested as much into video equipment as I have into music equipment over the years, just because it's interesting to me to do that side of it as well. Mm. But, you know, on a technical front, there's a bunch of stuff that, I don't know, not everyone knows about, but if you know it, 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 it makes your video shoot have all the hallmarks of a cool video. So like we were talking about the speed thing. If you yeah. prepare a backing track of your video, first mm. of all, put a count in on it. You don't want it just to start because no one knows when to start performing at the beginning mm-hmm. of the video. So you put a count in, count of eight normally at the beginning of your video. Uh, and then when you bounce it out, 
use something, QuickTime used to do it, I don't think it does anymore, but you can find a piece of software online somewhere that will generate something that runs at two times speed. And it has to be exactly double the speed, not 49%, mm. do you know what I mean? Or not, it has to be an exact double speed version. And then when you shoot it, you shoot it with the camera running at twice the speed as well. And when you play it all back at normal speed, it's in sync to the tune at normal speed, but everyone has that moving sort of slow motion vibe about them. It, it's the look of music videos. But you can also do the opposite. If you shoot it at half speed, and you know you, you lip sync at half speed, it's a bit weird, everything's going very slow. When you put it at normal speed, it all looks hyper. It looks like hyper real. Oh, hold on. Dan drops his coffee. <clears throat> so yeah, the different speed for your backing track that you're lip syncing to, that can give you some really easy effects. It doesn't cost anything. Yeah, the thing, I mean, again, the the beauty of videos for me was the, um, you know, the incentive and the the, the restriction that breeds creativity sometimes yeah. from it, you know. Just a cool location can be more yeah. than enough sometimes. Well, do you remember the one you did for Ricky recently? You know, it's, um, you, you, you've not got a huge budget, but you know what looks good like you're yep. talking about the speed thing you know how to make things look a certain way yeah that was just some nice lighting bit of projection bit of yeah we used the projector to light it I, I i knew i wasn't going to have a budget for lighting it so i i i made uh, an animation that was synced up to the music and i projected <coughs> it onto the performers and then filmed it and it, that looked great it did look great yeah it did yeah you just gotta be clever you know simple things like if if you don't have some some haze or some smoke then you won't see your lights. Your lights will still light the people in the video, but you won't see the lights. If you want to see the lights, you mm. need haze. All this stuff you pick up, the more you do. But the thing is, this what we're sort of grinding out here is that the time is... You're talking about MTV. Yeah. We used to record videos off MTV, like we did off, yeah, yeah. off the singles chart on Radio 1. True. You know, yeah. um, but... The, the the format has disappeared, hasn't it? People won't sit still and watch a video for three and a half minutes now. People so will watch what they want to watch, watch a reel yep. for thirty seconds. If you get thirty seconds, yeah, you've made something pretty special. Well, the way I look at it, if if I put my other hat on and look at this as a manager, we quite often when we're promoting an album get invited on TV shows. You go and do a bunch of TV shows to promote what's coming out, and quite often they will ask you to do a performance. Mm. You know and. I don't know if anyone knows, but when you perform on a TV show, that costs you some money. You have to pay for the gear, you have to hire the crew, everything else, and you don't get any control over the camera angles or the lighting. And I'm, as I'm sure you can imagine, if you're doing a performance on a chat show or something like that, mm. it's not going to look great, it's not going to sound great, it's going to be weird angles, you know, it's going to be a bit odd. So if you can say to them, I wouldn't ask for that, but we'll give you a video. They're more than happily played a video. It's easier yeah. for them too. And you've completely controlled what it looks like. You decide what goes out there. What is the visual representation of your artist? Of course, the classic example of that was uh, Beastie Boys doing Sabotage on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, that was classic. Was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are some times where you, yeah, you, get, it, you get it right. Yeah. But I'm sorry to say, uh, you know... Um, you know, CD, uh, vinyl is coming back. CDs, MP3s, the the pop single. I'm happy to kind of see the back of. Yep. I miss I miss music videos. I yeah. love watching music videos. I love making music videos. Yep. Well, I you know I think they may be on the wane a little bit at the moment, but it's only because the 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 way we consume them is changing. Mm. I think kids these days have a short attention span, the TikTok thing, 15 second videos. It's just one of the few things, things where, you know, I would, you know, you, you know when you make a tune you're excited about. Yeah. And then you go to bed and you're laying in bed and it's at night and you're thinking, and then an idea hits you. Yep. And and that's what music videos were to me. Yeah. It was that, I. it was like, you know, we've got three minutes you just get this spark of inspiration. Yeah. And it's not like making a film where you've got to no, think no, no. scene by you scene. Haven't got, you you know. haven't got to come up with that much depth. <clears throat> it's just, you yeah. just need three minutes of something cool or something I just thought it was a beautiful format. And yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, genuinely Well, I don't think it's all gone. I, I think it, it, will, it, will, it will hang around and it mm. will have a resurgence. It's just it's just dependent on the style of music, I think. I think we're in, we're in a bit of a dip with that kind of stuff. But it's an interesting point as well, though, is that the skills you need to make a music video that is as good as what what big artists are doing are not that far different from the skills you need to learn to make a record. 
they're they're similar mm. they're similar and whatever computer you're running your door on is probably fast enough to run a video editor on and like dan says with an iphone or even just a cheap you know mirrorless camera mm. you can start putting together music videos and it's something these days you probably can't afford to hire someone to do there might be someone you know that's interested in it and they can do it for you but if you can learn to do that mm. that's another string to your bow if you go as a producer or an artist with some songs and some video clips that have got some production value to them it's a level up if an artist comes to me and they're like i've got a video to show you i'm interested yeah i want to have a look yeah way more interesting than someone sending me an mp3 mm. so it's worth thinking about the skills are not that far removed no no i miss it i'm gonna go and make a make a music video let's do it <laughs> have to make some music first we will yeah <laughs> anyway that means we have to get out of here so been nice to chat to you once again we will be back in episode 15 can you believe it no i can't no 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 15. there's only right, like we discussed there's only you that watches these all the way through <laughs> you probably we forgot to mention that the last episode of visit ship we did was the 200th we did 200, 200 episode yeah jeez yeah. jesus we need a break yeah we do yeah <laughs> anyway uh, like the video that'd be handy subscribe to the channel we have an Instagram Studio Life 101 there's a Patreon there's a merch store there's a whole bunch of other stuff it's all down there we will see you in episode 15 episode 15 adios adios <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>